um, where we partner with community colleges and help them to better understand what it takes for students to be able to come into the institution, be successful, and then move successfully either into a four-year institution or into the workforce. In terms of our model and how we keep the, uh, the center afloat, we do assessments with community colleges. We then take that data, we do research on that data, and then what we learn from that, we turn that into training and development activities and exercises for the colleges that we work with. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of some data that's from Eccles K, which is an early childhood study. And these are based upon a, a data from students who are in kindergarten, looking at the focal teacher and who's, a, who's the focal teacher in the classroom, and then basically looking at male students. So this is white males, uh, black males, Asian males, Latino males, and multi-ethnic males. And early on, we can start to see differences in terms of the perceptions of teachers um, that, and that they have of different children. So in the case in this uh, study, as you saw here, which is one I'm working on right now, for black males, they're more likely to be perceived by their teachers as being incapable of learning than those who are um, of other ethnic groups. Obviously, this is a concerning pattern given that this is kindergarten data. We see some of the manifestations of how this plays out, particularly as it relates to criminalization and perceptions of these youth. Um, one way in that's, which that plays out is through what we call exclusionary discipline. That occurs through suspensions and expulsions. This is data from the high school longitudinal study and looking at students who've been exposed to some form of exclusionary discipline by the time they hit ninth grade. As you can see, there's much higher rates for black males um, that represents represented right here than in comparison to any of their peers. We also see then the manifestation of this in terms of student outcomes. Uh, these are data from basically uh, looking at NAEP scores for reading, which we know reading is foundational to any other type of learning that students will have. Uh, and what you can see here is that if you look at the orange bar, that represents students who are below basic in fourth grade. Those same patterns are evident for mathematics in fourth grade and only continue to progress as they uh, transition throughout the educational pipeline. It manifests in what we see in high school graduation rates where there's disparate outcomes for students. The blue bars represent those students who graduate from high school in a four-year time frame. So nationally, according to the Schott Foundation from their research, 52% uh, of black males will graduate from high school in a four-year time frame in comparison to 78% of white males. So and when we look at our community colleges, which is where the vast majority of these students end up going because it's the primary pathway into post-secondary education for students who are low income, first generation, and students of color, we start to see other disparities. So community colleges uh, don't have one typical measure of what it means, uh, means for a student to be successful. So for example, in a four-year institution, a student comes in, four years they're supposed to earn a bachelor's degree. In a community college, it can be a certificate, it can be a degree, it can be transfer. So it's a comprehensive, comprehensive success rate. And as you, as you can see, the groups that are highlighted in red represent those that fall below the state average. And this is data from this, that's from California. So what we do then is, based upon this information, is we partner with colleges to help them better understand what's taking place on their campuses through a series of assessments that we've created for them to look at their students, to look at their faculty, and to look at those who are working with and supporting their faculty. We do that through monthly webinars where we pro provide training and development. We had one this morning that was focused on food and housing insecurities and the role that that has in success for these men. We have uh, 123 campuses that partner with us. Eight campuses joined ju just this week, so the consortium is growing. Um, so in terms of the data, I'm a quantitative researcher, and all the work that I do is in partnership with Frank Harris III, who's a qualitative researcher, and we put those two lenses together to better understand what's really taking place with these students. So these are just some of the different instruments that we've created as part of our work with the center. It takes a long time to validate an instrument and get it ready for prime time to be able to go and then use it at a campus and help them understand what's taking place. Our bread and butter is really the community college success measure. We've done, done that now with 92 colleges and have surveyed over 73,000 students. And then, of course, that data is used to inform the professional development that we do with them. In terms of community colleges, there's 947 public two-year institutions in the country. And these serve as the primary pathway into post-secondary education for all black and Latino males. Uh, nationally, 64 to 65% if you look at the difference between those who are in public two-year versus public four-year. So vast majority are in community colleges. Now the point to keep in mind here that's very important is that in California it's much higher. We're talking about 83 to 84% because of our large community college system. We have 113 institutions, which is a large segment of what uh, we see in the country. We also see that a large percentage of these guys delay their enrollment into post-secondary education. So they don't transition directly from high school to community college, but they take a break. They go into the military, go into the workforce, do apprenticeship programs. So the average age nationally is 28 to 29 years old, which means that they're out of a classroom for a long period of time. 
So you see that the delayed enrollment rate for black men is 54%, for Latino men it's 43%, for white males it's 36%. And so what we see then is if a student's been out of the classroom five, six, seven years, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go to community college and they're going to take an assessment test on subject matter that they haven't seen in years. And so that is one of the reasons we see such a high percentage of these students in developmental education. We also know that many of these students attend college less than full time. And the number one reason for that is that they're working. 74% of them, um, that's the reporting in terms of, of what, uh, why they're doing that. Now, here's what we know about the working conditions for these students. They're vastly different from that of their peers. So they're typically in jobs that are physically demanding. They're moving boxes, digging ditches, stocking shelves, doing construction site cleanup. Second, they're in jobs that occur late at night, so they're either working the late night shift or the overnight shift, getting off of work 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, first class at 8 a.m. Walking into class groggy, the faculty member sees him back of the class, you know, looking sleepy and not being attentive, and they think, well, he doesn't care, not recognizing that there's a lot of other things that are going on, and those are really just the jobs that are available to them. And the third characteristic is that they're in jobs that are temporary in nature, so they're transitioning from one job to another job to another job, and sometimes doing three to four transition in a given semester. This is the model that informs all the work that we do. Uh, we did this model initially with the synthesis of the research that had been conducted, but since then we've probably done 60 to 70 studies over the past five years that have been based on this model that have been published in, in different journals and, uh, and a few reports that we've done. It follows a simple IEO approach. We take into account the student's background characteristics, societal factors such as stereotypes, and then we recognize that there are four primary domains that influence their success while they're in college. The non-cognitive domain, which is really looking at issues like their confidence in their academic abilities, their perceptions of the usefulness of college, the degree to which they're engaged on campus, using services on campuses and meeting with faculty, the external pressures, which is where a lot of the, the concerns occur, the campus ethos, which is really the climate and culture we create on our campuses that make students feel like they belong, like they're valued, and then structural conditions, which are probably where the biggest breakdowns occur. In fact, when we talk with colleges, we often use a quote that I heard from uh, Dean Johnson one time, and we've been using it ever since, and it's from W. Edward Deming, every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. And oftentimes when we're looking at disparate outcomes in community colleges, a lot of it is systemic breakdowns. In terms of stereotypes, we recognize that there are three primary stereotypes that these men often face based upon the work that we've done. The first uh, is the assumption of criminality, so the assumption that they are up to no good, that they're on campus at nighttime because they're there to steal something instead of being on campus to study. They might be asked for their IDs more than other students, so we hear a lot of that, particularly in the qualitative work that we do. Second is, an, is really associated with an assumption that they are academically inferior. So one of the things that we found in a study that we did, eight minutes, all right, one of the things we found in the study that we did is that students basically said, you know, if a faculty member asks a question in class, I'll know the answer, but I won't say anything. And a faculty member says, does anybody have any questions? Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll know I need to ask something, but I won't. And we ask, okay, well, why is that? And they say, well, they'll think I'm dumb, they'll think I'm ignorant, they'll think I'm stupid. And those are messages that are oftentimes reinforced from their faculty as well as from their peers. Um, I'm also going to just skip to stressful life events because external pressures is one of the things we know is really salient with this population. Particularly what we're looking at recently is food and housing insecurities. These are data from, our uh, from a sample that we just recently did on a report that came out at the end of last year. So these are students who are experiencing some form of housing insecurity. That can range from being homeless to a student who's couch surfing, sleeping in a friend's closet, really not knowing where they're going to stay. As you can see here, this represents the bar for black males. Nearly half of them are experiencing that challenge. The next slide looks at food insecurities. These are students who simply don't know where that next meal is going to come from. If you're hungry and you don't know where you're going to sleep, obviously those are things that affect a student's success in school. And the last thing is looking at the structural domain. Colleges have really created um, systemic inequities that really serve to produce a lot of the disparities that we see. One of the biggest challenges that we see is that a lot of these students are in developmental education, remedial classes, basic skills. And 80% of the teachers who teach, based upon the recent uh, study, study that we did, 88% of the teachers who are teaching those classes are part-time faculty members. And a higher percentage of those faculty members are those who we call freeway flyers, which means that they're teaching at one community college, then another community college, then another community college, and transitioning to multiple colleges. So the majority of time that they would have to spend in interacting with students and working with students, they're spending on the freeway, transitioning from one classroom to another. And the challenge with that is oftentimes these are the same faculty members who don't have offices on campus, aren't paid for office hours, and if they do have offices, they're located out in the bungalows and they're sharing them with multiple individuals. So structural issues that we have to be aware of that are certainly influencing success for our men of color.
Questions for Luke? So, uh, given this, all these studies that you've done, mm -hmm. do you have an implementation plan and have you been able to demonstrate success in addressing some of these issues in community colleges? Yes, so we have, the implementation really begins in, from our perspective with the faculty members. So if you think about a faculty member who teaches in the community college, the vast majority of them have never been trained how to do so. So if I'm a faculty member in biology, I go, I get a degree in biology, I go where I work in the field for a few years, I get a master's, and then I go straight into the classroom with no training in andragogy, pedagogy, or any of those kind of things we'd like to see. So the challenge is what people do is they teach how they were taught. And with our students of color, in particular our men of color, how the faculty members were taught is typically not how they learn. So we do a lot of interventions focused on how do you teach, how do you employ culturally relevant teaching, uh, understanding of you know, basic issues in terms of cross-cultural relations, microaggressions, uh, practices that validate students. And colleges that participate um, with us in some of our trainings that we do, we do assessments to determine the extent to which that information is received and, and serves the change. And we have seen a lot of change over the, over the past couple years with our partner colleges. It looks different across each campus because each campus begins in a very different place. But we also see different areas in which uh, some of the thinking is very entrenched in terms of deficit perspectives of students. Uh, one of the challenge areas that we oftentimes have are working with faculty members in, in philosophy. Um, because there, there's just oftentimes not an openness to understanding some of the, the different perspe perspectives as it relates to what we call equity mindedness. Yeah. Uh, so, this might be a simple question, but was there anything during your research that you found was surprising to you that maybe at the time you're like, oh, okay, I expect to see these, but it actually turned out to be much more surprising and it was kind of maybe an aha moment for you, like, oh, wow, this has much bigger effect than I thought it would, or, you know, something like that. Yeah, I think um, w based upon one of that, those recent studies that was looking at part-time faculty and looking at uh, their teaching and learning practices, so one of our instruments is called the Instructional Development Inventory, and it looks at 14 different teaching and learning areas that we know are important for men of color and other underserved students in community colleges. And one of the things that we found is that, so we compare them to national benchmarks that we've gotten from a, a sample that we've done of colleges in the top quarter producing community colleges in the country. And we break them, then the scores down in comparison to those benchmarks for faculty members based upon whether they're teaching full-time tenured, full-time tenured track, part-time just teaching here, part-time teaching at multiple institutions. Uh, and when we started looking at that data further and got down to developmental education, uh, what we saw is that those who are what we call freeway flyers, we knew that the scores would be bad, but we have what are basically is a triage approach in terms of how we present it to the colleges. It's more sophisticated in terms of the analysis, but what we present has to be something that they can consume. And what we found is that what we have is, are, are scores for what we call an immediate concern, and at every single level for that population, we're seeing what we call an immediate concern, which to us speaks to some of the structural conditions that are producing inequities for our students. And when we think about how many students don't make it through that developmental education sequence, some of that makes sense in terms of who we're placing in front of them in the classroom. So um, it's very disturbing that you say that um, also teachers have that feeling of black men being less capable. And I was wondering if you have data to show difference between white and black teachers. Do mm -hmm. also black teachers have that feeling or only white? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. It's a tough question, but it's yeah, a no, I mean, it's, realistic it's, it's, question. It is a question that, that we've received before. Um, so here's the thing. There, how I like to think about it is that there are good teachers and there are bad teachers, and there's teachers of all ethnic backgrounds. And sometimes we see where a person of color can also harbor some of the same perceptions, and sometimes we don't. So oftentimes what we find to be more important than just the racial background of the faculty member is what we call um, their perception of equity-mindedness and institutional responsibility. So if they're a person who rationalizes, uh, hey, if I have students who aren't being successful in my class, and the first place they look is, okay, what am I doing, as opposed to what's wrong with them, we find that those are faculty members who tend to perform better. Now, we do tend to find that faculty of color have higher scores for equity-mindedness in general, but I wouldn't want to make the assumption that all faculty of color are excellent at teaching uh, men of color. From our perspective, all faculty white or whatever make, can teach men of color, but they have to teach them as men of color. They have to understand their lived experiences. They have to understand the role that their racial identity, and in, in particular, when we're talking about men, their masculine identity has on their success. So, you know, concepts such as 
understanding what it means to be a breadwinner and how that influences success. Uh, you know, my role in terms of being a man, am I willing to seek out help and accept help when it's offered to me? So I think having an understanding of those things tends to be more of a determinant of whether they're successful than, than race. That being said, we do tend to see patterns that show that there are higher levels of success among those faculty of color, but particularly because they use certain teaching strategies that um, are oftentimes based upon their own tra training experiences that tend to be uh, more supportive of our students of color. But I don't want to paint a broad brush and say, yeah. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. I, my question is regarding the health impact the, over time of some of the uh, individuals that you've studied uh, because it, the, the risks for uh, chronic stress and yeah. so forth. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so I mean that's something that we're very attentive to in the work um, that we do because those kind of stressful conditions uh, on campus result in, in what we, you know, other, other challenges. So oftentimes what we see with this population, not even talking about what happens in terms of the interactions that they have with their faculty, which oftentimes produce um, stress and anxiety. If we look at the, the, the challenges that they're facing externally, you know, with food insecurities, with housing insecurities, with those employment conditions, transportation also tends to be a real concern for these students. We know that they spend a lot more time um, going to and from campus than their peers. Um, it's not uncommon for us to be interviewing a student and they tell us to take two, three buses to get to campus. One bus runs late, one bus leaves early, and they're late to class, and they've taken you know, an hour and a half to get there. Um, so we do see the, the, the role that stress has in that. Now, because of our training, we focus much more so on other outcomes, but it is certainly something that we're, we recognize is, is in play. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. All right, thank you.